All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome. Today is Tuesday, February 28th, 2023. Welcome to episode number 300 and change. I can't even see. What is it? Tell me, computer, computer, episode 312 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier, and over the next 45 minutes, me, you, House of Pain, Cyber Munchkin, William Welch, DP, Philip Martin, and the rest of the Simply Cyber community are going to be shredding the top cyber news stories of the day, and I'll be giving my expert analysis and opinion on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner, so how you can take this information and operationalize it at work to help reduce cyber risk for your organization, or or if you're looking to break in the industry, you want to you wanna blow the minds, knock socks off interviewers, bring the freshest takes on the top news of the day to the interview. We're not talking theory people. We're not talking academic book exercises. We're talking, oh, I don't know, Hive ransomware getting taken down by the FBI because servers in Los Angeles. I don't know, did you know that interviewer? Right? We're bringing the hotness. Talk about LastPass. We're gonna be doing it. You're gonna get tons of value from the stream, I guarantee you. Terminology, concepts, networking it's going to be sick okay but before we get into how sick that is and all the awesomeness that is the daily cyber threat briefing we want to say thank you to our sponsors wrapping up the month of february thank you very much to barricade cyber solutions the evergreen sponsor of simply cyber's daily cyber threat brief listen barricade cyber solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. Links in the description below. Also right here on screen, you can see Barricade Cyber's website, Eric Taylor's calendar. Yes, there's a lot of good information here, but the key thing I want you to take away is this calendar. You click on it, you can meet with Eric today at noon, two hours from now, debrief from the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing, meet with Eric, talk about what it would look like uh, for them to help you in the event of a cyber incident. What would it cost, right? You got to have numbers, maybe an NDA in place, got to get the lawyers involved, get all that crap done up front. So when you really need help, you're not getting... You're not getting hung up in red tape and bureaucracy. Also, shout out and love to IT Pro TV, affiliated with Simply Cyber. Um, appreciate the the February sponsorship. They will continue to sponsor the Worldwide Wednesday segment, but we will be saying adieu to IT Pro for the um, the the you know I guess the flagship sponsorships or whatever you want to call this. Guys, if you're looking for binge-worthy content that is really, really well produced around cybersecurity, audit, IT, practice exams, practice labs, everything curated and organized in a wicked simple way and delivered but in a high-quality way, check out IT Pro TV. Use the code SIMPLYCYBER30 at checkout to get 30% off your first month or your first year. It's sick. It's sick. Also want to say what's up and shout out to team live if you are here live i love it i see 96 of you you guys are all stacking here in here this is perfect we're gonna have a great show for you today hashtag team live and chat if you are feeling froggy hashtag team replay if you're on uh team replay i did see your comments about the simply cyber community challenge i think we're gonna kick that off um in just a few days here team replay so stay tuned for that if your team hybrid meaning you came in late but you're doing double time to get caught up to the live. I see you. I know you're a, <clears throat> a smaller uh, fraction of the audience, but I see you team hybrid dabbling in the team replay team live section. And then want to say shout out and love. Hey, what's up, Sean Washington? Sean Washington, always on the uh, LinkedIn. I love it. Uh, hashtag passive observer or hashtag team lurker, whatever you want to call yourselves. If you've been a member of the Simply Cyber community, but you haven't voiced yourself, you haven't said hi in chat, you haven't done anything, and you just want to take dip your toe in the water, your first little foray into the networking element, drop a hashtag passive observer. Let us just say hi to you. 
No pressure. We're not going to like light you up. Hashtag passive observer. What's up? Each episode of the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing does count for half a CPE because it's 45 minutes long, which uh, qualifies for half an hour of rich content delivered fresh to your face. Be sure to say what's up in chat. That way you can take credit for it. What's up, Jordan Turney? Good to see you. Good to see you in chat. Hey, Eric Taylor. I, I see you. Good to see you. Uh, Bucky Alibi or Alibi. Good to see you, Passive Observers. Philip Martin, my man. Guys, g Malo, good to see you. Welcome to the party. All right, guys. As you guys know, I, I saved the jaw jacking for the end. So let's get into the news. Sit back, relax. Whether you're Team Live, Team Passive Observer, Team Replay, Team Hybrid, it's going to sound the same. Sit back, relax, and let the awesome waves of the top cyber news wash over you in an awesome wave. From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. It's Tuesday, February 28th, 2023. CISA says to stop passing the security buck. At a recent event at Carnegie Mellon University, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency Director Jen Easterly called on technology companies to fundamentally shift product design around security. She said frequently tech companies shift the burden of security to consumers, yep. ending up where we've unwittingly come to accept as normal that such technology is dangerous by design. Easterly questions why companies get blamed for data breaches when they run unpatched software, but questions why no blame falls on the manufacturer that required too many patches. She pointed to memory safe languages, transparent disclosure policies, and secure coding practices as ways vendors can improve. The All right. Oh, boy. Kimberly. This one is rooted deep in the straight cash, homie. Now, okay, I'm going to, as much as I love me some Jen Easterly, and I understand what she's doing here. I do have some uh, <laughs> some independent thoughts. Okay, so first of all, yes, I agree. First of all, way to go, Jen Easterly and CISA for continuing to uh, push um, a public-private partnership between the U.S. government and private sector. Uh, speaking at Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Mellon, a fantastic university, by the way, for computer science and for pushing um, like applied research forward especially in our industry. Okay, love me some Carnegie Mellon. Second of all, Jen is, is saying that it's incumbent upon the vendors to implement better security in their products. Now, I think vendors, um, you know, like the way Microsoft used to do it in the 90s, just like bundle it up and push it into market and fix it on, when, on Monday and then fix it on Wednesday is a reckless approach to product development. But, but guys... Great cash, homie. First mover advantage, if you've ever taken an economics course or a business class, first mover advantage, if you're the first to market with a solution, first to market with a chat GPT solution, first to market with a new operating system, first to market with like uh, uh, um, these freaking uh, like hoverboards that don't really hover, but they, they're like, I don't know, like scooters or something, right? You corner the market. People get all frothed up and they're like, oh, I got to get me one of those, right? That's called first mover advantage. And there's a huge market incentive. There's a perverse financial incentive for the business to go to market as quickly as possible to circum uh, to bypass com competitors, uh, excuse me, competitors from competing in the market, right? So if, 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 these, if these groups take on Jen's approach completely, that means you'll never get to market. You'll just spend all your time, all your money, all your resources making something safe and not getting to market. And it's impossible to secure something fully, right? There's always inherent risk. There's always uh, residual risk. Like you cannot secure everything. And how is a vendor going to develop a piece of equipment or technology or software and know definitively that there are no vulnerabilities, right? That it is considered safe. You really can't because you can't prove a negative, right? Now, having said all that, I think that there is a balance in between. And I do champion what Jen is saying here. There is no responsibility on vendors um, when their when their crap gets broken, and it's like, oh well, you should have configured it correctly. Uh, like, like I, I I almost feel that's what they like. They're like, they're like, mm, should have configured it correctly. That's your problem. And it's like, bro, how about you make it so I can't deploy it without configuring it correctly? How about you don't allow me 
default admin creds on the box. How about you stop network traffic from going through it until you configure the admin password? That would be a technical control that would absolutely assure that I would put those things in place. Unfortunately, again, perverse incentive. Vendors want happy consumers. Happy consumers plug their device in and it just works. That's a happy consumer. You know what? is not good, a consumer that plugs it in and it doesn't work and then they're complaining like, oh, this piece of technology sucks. Or the, the vendor has to hire a bunch of support staff and FAQs uh, in order to address how to properly configure it. So it needs to be engineered in a way that is user friendly, but is also secure by default. So I know I was all over the fence on this one. I do feel strongly that there is a responsibility of vendors to produce more um uh, product that is enabled secure by default or forces security configuration before production deployment it's just there is a money man it's it's freaking money like at the end of the day if i have two products and one is like plug and play and one is plug and configure and play the plug and play one is going to sell it as ease of use customers are happy listen to our testimonials so this is one of the shortcomings of capitalism honestly um and when the people formed capitalism as a theoretical framework for a market, they didn't consider information security, obviously. We were late. We were parking the car. We dropped them off at the front, and then we swung around to the back of the lot. We parked it. And they made all the decisions on what capitalism is before we got inside. And we're like, whoa, whoa wait, guys. So unfortunately, we missed the bus on that one. Um, anyways, good job on Jen calling to action. This is a very simple problem to discuss, but a very difficult problem to solve. All right. And, and frankly, the only way that you're going to solve it, and I know libertarians might be like, Roar! but the only way to solve this is with regulations and financial penalties. If you find companies for not doing certain things, then they're going to do it because now you're talking about their money. Great cash, homie. Security fallout of Russia's war with Ukraine. With the one-year anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Recorded Future released a report looking at the larger cybersecurity impacts. The physical realities of war definitely saw an impact in cyber operations, with threat actor groups fleeing Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus to avoid the conflict. In addition, the combination of IT and cybersecurity professionals leaving Russia and drafting of young men has begun to show a brain drain in its hacker reserves. This can be seen in a fall in activity on criminal forums, marketplaces, and social media. This also saw cyber criminals targeting each other across national lines. Previously, these groups, including the Conti Ransomware Group, worked together to target other areas. Can okay, so, okay. So if you were to, like, when you say this out loud, it's not surprising. Now, you may not have thought of this on your own, or like, it, it wouldn't dawn on you, like, oh, this is the uh, impact of, of this thing. But it is really interesting. And again, like, for me personally, when I hear this, I'm like, oh, this totally makes sense. Now, what is the gist of this story? Okay, let's be real for a minute. Okay, and I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I am being uh, geopolitically sensitive, okay? You guys know me, I try, I try not to like mix up, like it's probably not good for my YouTube numbers. I don't try to be like polarizing or, you know, fake, fake a bunch of like bull crap to get people amped up. Listen, here is the reality. A lot of cyber criminals operate out of Eastern Europe. That's a fact, not an opinion, okay? Nation states are all over the place, but a lot of cyber criminals, for-profit crime, operate out of Eastern Europe. They can operate with impunity, frankly. Um, they're not really, they, they can't be touched by uh, the Department of Justice, the FBI. They, they have bulletproof hosting. Their host country typically turns a blind eye as long as they're not attacking the host country, which is why you'll see malware that looks at like what language the keyboard is in and shuts itself down if it happens to be in Cyrillic, for example. Okay, so like, let's just put that aside. Now, there is a major freaking conflict happening, obviously, in Eastern Europe right now with Russia invading Ukraine. Now, Let's just pretend for a second that I am like a wicked good cyber criminal hacker, okay? And Justin Gold, who lives up the street, is a wicked good cyber criminal hacker. And because the West Coast people aren't on right now, we can we can make them the adversaries. Poner Joe and Nick Barker, West Coast lovers, uh, lovers, excuse me, West Coast love, 
And uh, Brady McNulty, I think, is on the West Coast also. They're, they're Team West Coast, right? And if we're constantly like committing crime and we don't care about each other, we're like, there's so much, there's so much um, targets and so rich targets, so many businesses that the West Coast, the East Coast, right? Like taking it back to like a 90s um, rap battle type thing. There's, there's plenty of food for everybody on the buffet. So no one's fighting. Now, it becomes a war between East Coast and West Coast. We turn our focus. So immediately, my focus is no longer on crime for profit. It's on protecting the East Coast. It's on protecting my family. It's protecting my assets, right? Patriotism, perhaps, right? East Coast, yeah, right? So so when the focus turns that way, it's just, it's just freaking math, man. If there's a thousand people attacking, doing cybercrime on businesses, and 800 of those people turn their focus to what's important to them today, which is not cybercrime for profit, but patriotism, defending their space, um, attacking their adversaries or perceived adversaries, then you're going to have a natural shift in the amount of crime happening. I will tell you, like, it's great for us because we're living as, you know, victims and, and like, we're the ones being targeted and the, we're the ones defending. And by no means has it gone fully away. Uh, Felicia's West Coast. All right. So, Felicia, you're on the West Coast, too. Attacking. Okay. It, it's just, it, dude, it's like Maslow's Pyramid of Needs, right? Like, if, like, if, if, if. It, it 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 just makes sense, right? Like you're not going to use your skills to do cyber attacks for crime and profit if your higher priority is protecting your family or protecting your country or protecting whatever, right? So this makes total sense that there would be a quote unquote brain drain. I I I would almost say it's less of a brain drain and more of like a, a refocus of of targeting. But at the same time, there's been a degradation in quality. And I've been talking recently. I just, this is occurring to me right now as I'm shooting from the hip. I've been talking recently about, um, oh, like, you know, we're not winning the war on ransomware, but we've won a couple key battles. You can see some momentum in the metrics, uh, less ransomware attacks, lower ransoms, insurance companies not paying out, um, FBI, you know, like we're, we're, we're winning some key battles in the ransomware. I'm beginning to question that that statement that I made, because this right here, the, these Eastern Europeans are a prime pool of attackers that are committing ransomware. And this, this story is actually bringing to light the consideration that perhaps it's more a lack of attackers committing ransomware than it is us doing a good job of protecting ransomware. Because if that's the case, we're in for a world of hurt. Because whenever this Ukrainian-Russian conflict resolves, there's going to be a lot of hungry people. There's going to be a lot of unemployed. Russia's economy is totally dorked up. So there's going to be a lot of desperate, hungry, capable individuals that are going to turn to cybercrime. Just guys, like, I, again, I'm doing this off the cuff, so I don't even know if this makes sense. But think about this. Think about when... Um, the, the like the the naval wars of the 1600s right england colonialism boats everywhere mariners everywhere sailors everywhere right and then the conflict ended like the whole the whole like revolutionary war whatever it was like all of that ended okay and then there were just a bunch of people who knew how to fight who knew how to sail who knew how to do things and they were hungry and couldn't get a job so what did they do? They applied their skill sets and became pirates and they got paid and they had a good time. You know what I mean? Like it, to me, there's a natural, it seems like an obvious correlation that like once this resolves, there's going to be a lot of people who know how to do things that are going to be in a tough spot. And dude, I don't care how high and mighty and righteous you are or how strong your moral compass is. If you are pushed into a corner and you need to do something to provide for your family, you know, the line gets blurry quickly. Um, so just look out for that. But this, you know, this is a win for us. We'll take it. That bans TikTok on government devices. Canada's Treasury Board Secretariat President Mona Fortier That's announced it. that no government devices will be allowed to use TikTok after February 28th. Fortier cited unacceptable levels of risk to privacy and security, although characterized this as a precautionary move. She also said ByteDance's data collection can be used to create vulnerabilities.
capabilities for future cyber attacks. It does not believe the TikTok app compromised any government information to date. Yeah, no government information in China. Don't worry about the you know prime minister's physical security controls to enter uh, 10 Downing Street. If you were here yesterday, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so Canada's banning TikTok. It seems like very much there's like a five eyes uh, movement to ban TikTok, right? So US has banned it from government. UK or in, U, the European Union wants to ban it from government. I don't think that they have moved it to ban it yet or UK. And now Canada, uh, Trudeau is has banned it, right? Or whoever is in charge of Canada for, for passing legislation like this. Internal stranger, my Australian friends, oi, 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 guess what? Tinfoil hat, oh, it's not really a tinfoil hat, but I would guess, I would speculate that we will have a news story in the next 30 days that says Australia bans TikTok. Just a guess, just a guess, okay? It seems very much like following that um, that that trend, right? Why wouldn't it? Uh, the, 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 the five eyes, they kind of like move together in lockstep. So let's go with that. Um, no surprise. I'm not going to get into this. Like TikTok, I've talked about it numerous times on the channel. There's been multiple stories. Um, I've already flipped out on two stories, so I'll just kind of move forward. Uh, I do like that this is a 10 o'clock show this morning. So the West Coast people are online. So the whole East Coast, West Coast battle <laughs> has a little bit more meat on the bone. Uh, yeah. So anyways, just be careful with TikTok. Okay, guys. Carrier has announced an initiative to open network APIs. The GSM Association announced the Open Gateway Initiative, which will provide a framework to provide universal open source based APIs into carrier networks for developers. 21 carriers are signed up at launch, including Verizon, Vodafone, Orange, Barty Airtel, China Mobile, Deutsche Telekom, KT, and AT&T. There are no APIs live right now, but this announcement sets out API specifications for eight services, including SMS two-factor authentication, carrier billing, and device location. It also includes an API specification specifically called SIM swapping, but that's meant to make porting numbers easier. Of course, the unfortunate naming similarity does open the question about security considerations. AWS and Azure were named as cloud providers with carriers to provide API access to devs. And now we're- All right. Um, I'm just reading this. This is kind of interesting. I'm trying to understand it a little bit better. Okay, so again, oh my God. Great cash, homie. So th this is how I'm interpreting this, okay? Think about uh, mobile carriers, your Verizon, your, your T-Mobile, right? We've got more coverage than anyone else in the world. Look at our, our US map, okay? Those carriers have invested heavily in owning the 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 network itself where the dirt data traverses now we use apple iphones we use google android devices right but it's just an endpoint on the network right the network is a medium that we traverse and and over the years the 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 value of that network has depreciated because you know, like if I'm using AT&T and uh, Verizon's got similar network, then it becomes like a race to the bottom. Like, why would I pay extra if I can just use a, a, a similar commoditized network at a lower price? And I'm not talking about me and you. I'm not talking about me and you with our phones. I'm talking about big tech leveraging huge amounts of the, these networks, right? So I guess whatever, the carriers are getting pinched. They're probably losing money and they're trying to um survive frankly or get more more money right so it sounds like they're opening up apis apis are application programming interfaces and it's basically opening up and allowing functionality of services to other developers right so for the longest time, tech was just kind of built siloed and then API started coming on. A, a great example of an API, if you're not familiar with what APIs are, is Twitter, right? So Twitter, um, you know, you go on twitter.com and you type in like, hi, this is my tweet. Yeah, 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 right? Or check out daily cyber threat briefing every day, simplycyber.io slash streams, enter, whatever, right? 
Okay, so that's Twitter. But in order to make Twitter more usable, more functional, more useful, Twitter allows APIs, but very key functions, right? So you can post to Twitter, you can query from Twitter, you can like a tweet from, from uh, on Twitter using API calls. And of course you have to pass certain variables to the API, right? Like, a, like what's the content of your tweet? What tweet unique identifier is it that you're wanting to like, like, like double click and like, right? And P it allows people to write really nice, rich software that extends the functionality and capability of Twitter. A famous example that's just silly, but it's a good one, is the kid who um, used um, the kid who was posting every time Elon Musk's plane would take off and land. Now, that kid was using APIs from two services. One from whatever the FAA service is that has to report on flights going um, up and down in the United States, right? So the kid pulls on the API of the FAA to find out if Elon's flight has taken off. And then he immediately, when it says yes, he posts it to Twitter, right? This is all through API, all automation, all good to go. This is the power of APIs and why um, they're so valuable, okay? All of this is to say that the mobile carriers are now going to take advantage of that and open it up to these big tech companies, these conglomerates, in order to enhance their functionality, enhance their services. All you're going to see is a tighter integration and then a tighter capability. And from our perspective as end users, richer features and more rewarding experiences <clears throat> on our mobile devices and our tablets and stuff like that because of this functionality. Now, two things to point out. One, wherever there's API, there introduces security risk. Is Are the APIs being valid? Like, is there is there a sanitization of API calls? How are you protecting the API uh, keys, right? Are you posting them in GitHub, right? The yikes, right? So there's all sorts of different things with that. Secondly, can the API calls be abused? And thirdly, as you as you integrate these things and couple them, does there become any kind of critical dependency in the software or technology that you depend on at your business to deliver your service, whatever your service is at your business that makes you money, right? What you're there to protect. Is there some critical dependency now that's being introduced that you have to be mindful of from a security practitioner perspective on if these APIs break or they stop being offered or whatever? So... There's a lot of opportunity here. Just be cautious, be careful. If you're not familiar with Twilio, look up Twilio. They are a platform that offers all sorts of integration capabilities. It's very, very useful. Um, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, let's, let's do the mid-roll. From our sponsor, Conveyor. Just because your security questionnaire is from the Stone Age doesn't mean you have to answer it with cave era tools. At Conveyor, we implemented GPT-3 into our first-of-its-kind questionnaire eliminator, so teams of all sizes can blast through questionnaires faster than you could say prehistoric. Go beyond rewriting mediocre matches to get your questionnaire autofilled with the exact answers customers need. Join the top SaaS companies in the GPT-3-powered future by using Conveyor. Learn more at Conveyor.com. All right. So if you're new here, you know what we do at the mid-roll? We have a good time for about two minutes, so hang with us. Hey, 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 hey. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being here for the first half of the show. I hope you're getting value. If you are, would love for you to hit that like button for a hot second. Thank you to Barricade Cyber Solutions and ACI Learning uh, for their support through the month of February. Genuinely appreciate that, guys. Hitting the like button, whether you're getting educational value or entertainment value, goes a long way to helping other people in our community find Simply Cyber and become part of our community. Miss Mary with the super chat. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thank you, Miss Mary. Genuinely appreciate the super chat and the support. I'll get to Alana in a second, guys. If you're interested in getting an email from me every single Monday with three pieces of actionable intel that I write myself, and I think it's pretty darn good, go to simplycyber.io slash newsletter and sign up. If you don't like it, it's easy enough to unsubscribe. I don't make you jump through any hoops. You just click a button, and off you go. Now, ooh, just been with 10 months, my man. Now, guys, I do want to take a hot minute um, and share, uh, I guess, hold on, it is, well, let me do the Simply Cyber Community Challenge really quickly. Guys, the Simply Cyber Community Challenge is an initiative that we kicked off last week, and it's been going swimmingly. 
every single day, a member of the Simply Cyber community in, in live chat gets tagged by the previous day's member. What you do is, if you're tagged, you go onto LinkedIn and you post something on LinkedIn, um, what you love about cybersecurity, how you're get like what project are you working on? How the Simply Cyber community has impacted you, right? Whatever it is, add the hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. I'd also ask that you tag me at Gerald Osier in the post. And then I would ask everybody in the Simply Cyber community to go onto LinkedIn and connect with that individual. This is a long-term strategy. It's a very long-term goal, but the idea is that we're all here helping each other in chat every single day, whether you're on Team Replay or Team Live, we're helping each other. We're building a network. Networking is so unbelievably valuable in your career. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is this is a way for us to grow. It's gonna like it's gonna take a while, but we're gonna grow. So Alana was the tagged yesterday. Alana DM'd me this morning and said she had a conflict and cannot be here. But there is an exception to the rule. If you ask me, I will help you. Alana has asked me to extend the Simply Cyber Community Challenge tag to Tom Bishop. So Tom Bishop, if you are are you if you're in, if you're down for it sir you are now holding the baton for the simply cyber community challenge i hope that you can take on the challenge and continue it forward please let me know all right tom bishop is in all right so look for tom bishop on linkedin connect with him if you are not already and i would encourage you to connect with each other in the comments if you see someone who posts a comment in the Simply Cyber Community Challenge and it has a little two or a three next to their name, connect with them. I'm guaranteeing you it will be huge value. Now, one thing that I forgot uh, that we do every um, Tuesday is Tidbits Tuesday where I share a little bit of information about me and um, I forgot about it today, but let me just kind of kick it. What kind of tidbit can I drop about me? You know what? I'll tell you one thing. It's kind of a, a, a nuanced thing. I am from New England. I freaking love NHL playoff hockey. I cannot watch NHL hockey during the regular season, but if you love competition, if you love best of breed uh, and chaos, NHL playoff hockey is where it's at. Love it, love it, love it. Also, I'm a Bruins fan, so get ready for that. All right. Matthew Hibbert with the super chat. Much love, Big G. Did you hear Osin Curious is shutting down? No, I didn't. First of all, Super Chat. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thank you so much for the Super Chat. Do, yeah, I'm from New England. I guess it's a double tidbits. Uh, grew up there. Yeah, yeah. Olmark scored a goal. If you guys didn't see that, only I think only 13 times in NHL history has a goalie scored a goal. And only eight times of that was the goalie actually shooting the goal. If it, you know, if, if, there's, there's other ways that goalies could technically score. But eight times, and just the other night, Boston versus Vancouver. I know this is totally not cyber, but Boston versus Vancouver. Uh, Olmark, the goalie for Boston, took a wrist shot, and it traveled about 180 feet and went in the goal. It was insane. I definitely recommend you check that out. Love me. Love me some... Um, some NHL hockey. I am a Bruins fan, but I can't wait for the playoffs. And it's not just because the Bruins are in first place and everything else. Like I, I just, I could watch, I literally could watch like Winnipeg versus Ottawa. If it's an NHL playoff game, I don't care. Like Columbus versus Tampa Bay. Like I'm in. Okay. Let's continue on with the show. Signal won't participate in UK law. The draft legislation of the UK's online safety bill requires providers to block illegal content and enforce age restrictions on legal content. This creates all sorts of problems for end-to-end -end encrypted services as they don't know what content is being sent and often don't even store encrypted content on centralized servers. In response to this proposed legislation, Signal CEO Meredith Whitaker said it would exit any country if the choice were between remaining in the country and undermining the strict privacy promises we make to the people who rely on us, saying the UK is no exception. Yes, so this is awesome. So Signal is a messaging app, right? Kind of like WhatsApp or Telegram, whatever. And they are very 
very serious about privacy. I tried to get my friends on Signal with me. No one wanted to <laughs> no one wanted to buy in, so we we settled on Telegram. But Signal, if you are serious about security, if you are doing some kind of I don't want to say illegal stuff, but like say you're do, like doing something that's kind of like you don't want other people to know. And it doesn't have to be illegal or malicious, right? Say you're say you're like in an oppressive regime, right? Cuz it's not just all US here, right? Let's say you're trying to form some type of revolution or you're doing some type of investigative stuff and you're talking to a source that wants to remain anonymous for safety reasons. Signal is the way to go. They are legit. And this statement right here is literally the opposite of this. Great cash, homie. The Signal CEO says they would rather not operate in a market than compromise their platform's security. This is the opposite of capitalism, literally the opposite of capitalism. And I applaud them for that. That's, I mean, that's the story. There's not much else here, right? They, like, obviously, as technology gets used, you know, there'll probably be a, a, I don't want to call it a smear story, but there'll probably be a story of some criminal, you know, mass shooter, um, organized crime, you know, even a terrorist attack and they'll have used signal to communicate with each other. And the U S intelligence community or whoever was unable to intercept because of this technology. Oh, we need to ban this technology. Okay. Um, it's a double edged sword people. Okay. So I applaud signal for doing this and you know, good on them. If you're serious about your security signal is a good one uh, to use. Dutch police arrest cyber extortion suspects. Dutch police disclosed the arrest of three suspects aged between 18 and 21, which actually took place back in January. They're just disclosing it now. The police believe the three began criminal activity back in March 2021, blackmailing victims for up to 700,000 euros in order to not leak exfiltrated data. Since there is no honor among thieves, the group often just publish the data anyway after payment. This seems to have been a lucrative enterprise for the suspects, with police reporting its prime suspect had a criminal income of over 2.5 million euros. H All right. So, I mean, this is really good. Um, 18 to 21 year old. So, I mean, it just shows that. Um, it just shows that, like, you know, basically there's tools out there, whether these kids were smart and savvy and tech savvy and able to execute these missions, or if they were script kiddies and they were able to just get information, they were acting recklessly. Obviously, um, they said that they would collect the ransom and then release the information anyways. Uh, that's a very juvenile move, like watching the world burn kind of thing. Um, you know, there's certain behaviors that threat actors do like lapsus was a, you know, a noteworthy one where it, it's just, you can tell that it's a young um, criminal, like young in age, because they're making poor decisions for OPSEC. They're making emotion, like things that don't make any logical sense. And they're clearly emotional decisions um, or ego type decisions. So I'm not surprised that this happened. Uh, I'm also not surprised, and this is a key thing, the, the the three were actually arrested a month earlier in January, but it was kept secret, presumably for undercover investigations. If you're looking for a really good um, example of this, I mean, obviously, guys, when you get arrested, uh, if you're involved in some type of organized crime, um, the, the law enforcement will try to turn you as an informant, right? This happens with like um, drug arrests where they like want to go up to the dealer and then the dealer to the supplier, then the supplier to the main cartel, right? Like this happens all the time, but there's a really excellent two part story on Darknet diaries called Golem fun. Uh, where is it? I'm going to drop it in chat. Yeah, Golem fun. There's part one and part two. Uh, it was so good that they didn't have enough time uh, to cram it into one episode. Um, this is awesome. This guy was like basically created shadow crew. He's a lifelong criminal. He's actually a really nice guy. Like it's, it's, it's messed up. Like he's not a criminal in the way that we think of criminals in like movies like Thanos or something like that, where it's just like, Oh, you're clearly a bad guy. He's like, he's like a good guy. It's just like crime was his job. And, um, it's very interesting. He gets arrested, not, not a spoiler, but why is it tied to the story? He gets arrested and uh, gets turned by the Secret Service in order to rat out his friends. And there was a couple like really well 
um, publicized stories of his efforts and stuff like that. So I'd recommend, yeah, he had a really terrible childhood, but I'd recommend um, checking that out. Um, I just, for this, guys, I applaud it, dude. I want law enforcement to arrest cyber criminals. I want it to not be safe for cyber criminals. I want people who are on the fence about whether or not to commit cyber crime to think twice and not do it. I, I like, dude, so earned millions of dollars, millions, millions of dollars. Do you know what that means? That means some victim lost millions of dollars. These are not victimless crimes. People are losing, like businesses go out of business. People lose their jobs. They're not able to pay for their families. You know what I'm saying? Like these are not victimless crimes. And just because you're like, you're a sick cyber criminal. Ooh, elite zero day operating on the information super highway, you cowboy keyboard. No, you're a freaking criminal. I don't care if you rob me with a gun or a keyboard. You're still stealing money and you should still be held accountable and brought to justice. So good on these guys. Um, I hope they're used as uh, case studies so other people don't do anything. All right. MD will start production in Europe. Over the last few years, we've seen several companies looking to become less dependent on China for manufacturing. Some of this came in response to the supply chain crisis. Local production loss, particularly in India, also played a part. Now the phone maker HMD Global plans to spin up some phone manufacturing in Europe to meet a surge in customer demand, specifically citing security and sustainability concerns. This wouldn't move any existing Chinese manufacturing to Europe. Rather, HMD characterized this as quickly responding to local conditions in the market. No word on where, but the company is headquartered in Finland and moved its data centers there in 2019. All right, tinfoil hat. Here we go. So much tinfoil hat. Okay, guys. I'll, I'll tell you the objective story and what it means to us as practitioners, and then I'll give you my hot take on this one, okay? Fashy! Nokia phone maker, obviously there's a surge. They're saying we're opening plants in the EU to meet customer demand. This has nothing to do with InfoSec or cyber, really. Like this isn't gonna impact us one way or the other, right? If anything, maybe we'll have less of a lead time on mobile devices, which is even like a fringe market to businesses anyways. It's much more about like laptops uh, and what's the lead time on replacing aging hardware um, for servers and laptops and workstations, right? So this doesn't really move the needle on that. Okay, tinfoil hat, let's talk. Nokia's factories are in China. There has been a massive push, all right? There's been a massive push There's been a massive push in the space, right? This is, gen come on, man. This is, gen I'm, on, I'm doing a live stream here. Don't, don't take forever to load. This is just a few days ago. U.S. officials acknowledged Japan Netherlands deal to curb chip making exports to China. Okay, um, let's do this. Uh, let's see. NVIDIA is selling a Nerf GPU to China to get around restrictions, okay? U.S. officials order NVIDIA to stop selling chips to China. Guys, there has been a massive movement of decoupling chip manufacturing from China, okay? Here's what I think's going on here. If Nokia were to just pull up their stakes and rip everything out, it would be incredibly disruptive to a, a Nokia's business. Great cash, homie. That's where that problem's gonna come up. So what they do is, to me, this is just posturing. This is... This is a elegant dance of not pissing off, you know, China basically with a completely plausible explanation that, oh, we've got European demand. We're going to spin up some more plants. No big deal. Here's the tinfoil hat. Two years, two years time. Nokia's EU plants are going to scale up. The Chinese plants are going to scale down. <laughs> and that's it. Right? Oh, there's been less of a demand. Oh, it's cheaper in Europe to operate. Eh, whatever. Or, or the Five Eyes issue a um, NATO or whatever. It issues a, an edict that like, you're not allowed to sell or manufacture in China. Well, good thing Nokia spent two years ago building a plant or several plants to continue to make product, okay? That's what I think's happening here. I think this is a savvy move by Nokia reading the tea leaves and thinking that, 
Um, having all their eggs in the Chinese manufacturing basket is going to be a financial problem for them in the coming future, and they're hedging their bets here. This is what this is what I was thinking. All right. Apologies to NCC Group and Base Case for going over. I'll keep rolling. Twitter 2.0 lays off 10% of remaining staff. Since Twitter's acquisition by Elon Musk, product manager Esther Crawford quickly made a name for herself as a poster child for the new Twitter. She spearheaded the rollout of verification with Twitter Blue subscriptions before shifting over to the company's new focus on payments. However, sources speaking to The Verge, The New York Times, and Platformer report Crawford was among the company's latest rounds of layoffs, impacting 200 jobs, about 10% of the estimated 2,000 remaining employees. Also included in the latest cuts, Martin Kuyper, the founder of the now defunct newsletter service, Review. The All right, so... I mean, dude, Twitter? Okay, let's do a couple things here. Let's get our Elons, let's get our dumpster fires, and let's get our This Is Fine. This is, I, I thought, I thought the, um, the bulk of Twitter's hot mess on fire, uh, had resolved itself, but apparently not. Um, Esther Crawford, I mean, Twitter blue is like one of these kind of sussy things. Uh, I'm sure Elon, if I had to guess, Elon gave her some type of metrics that she had to meet. Like, oh, Esther, I want Twitter blue to be making $2 million a month by February 28th or else. And she didn't hit those metrics. I don't know if that's what happened, but based on what I've seen Elon do and the way he's driving the team over at Twitter, it's an easy, it's an easy uh, speculation that that's what happened. Um, I'm sure this woman will land on her feet quite well. When you're, when you're an executive at a big tech company like this, um, you know, she probably had a golden parachute. She'll, she'll land on her feet just fine. No big deal. Um, to me, the real story here is like, what is Twitter doing? Like, you are, you are such a hot mess, dude. Um, and I know some people like it's kind of the the snow globe has settled on people leaving the platform or staying on the platform, all these things. Um, Elon saying he wants to stabilize the organization and make sure it's financially healthy. Again, guys, great cash, homie. That's what that is. So. Again, kind of a light news day for us people. There isn't, this doesn't really impact us all too much. Um, a key layoff at Twitter, you know, it is what it is. So, uh, for sake of time, I'm going to, I'm going to move on and, uh, just jump into this. All right, guys, if you did get value today, I genuinely appreciate it. Uh, you being here and staying through to the end. I want to remind everybody that on Thursday this week uh, on Simply Cyber Live, I will be introducing you guys to Mike Warner. This guy was a CISO at Oshkosh, which is not Bagosh, not the kids um, corduroy overall company, but Oshkosh, the company that makes like heavy machine equipment. Like next time you're driving behind a dump truck that's pulling a cement mixer, look at the label. It'll say Oshkosh on it, okay? This guy... Not just a regular CISO. He like built a huge program, probably the most optimized information security program I've ever heard of. And, you know, I, I gave it like a splashy title, Confessions of a CISO. But we're going to talk to him about talent retention, uh, program building, optimization, dealing with the board. It'll be much more of a CISO featured talk. But just know if you're working in the GRC space and your goal is to be a CISO, there is going to be so much freaking unbelievable value for you to um, distill out of this conversation that you're going to love it. All right. Now, if you were just here for the news, I bid you good day and thank you very much for being here. I hope you can join us tomorrow on the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing, which will be at 8 a.m. Plus, it'll be Worldwide Wednesday. So please, please, please. Uh, make every effort to show up tomorrow. I do love it when we get the whole world. I think last week we missed South America. So uh, my Chilean, Argentinian, Guyana, or Guyanese, um, Suriname, Bolivia, Venezuela, we need you. Brazil, missed the biggest country. Thanks, Usha. I'll spend a couple minutes uh, jaw jacking if you guys are cool with that. All right, congratulations to um, Tom Bishop for getting tagged with the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Genuinely appreciate that. I saw a couple questions come through on uh, chat. Uh, I'll happy to answer those right now. Oh, Curious Spectre coming in from Nepal. Love that. 
Hey, all right. <laughs> we're doing simply. We're doing Worldwide Wednesday tomorrow. Marcus Seiler, you're from Brazil. Oh, please do be here tomorrow. Nate, my 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 day is going great, man. I taught this morning. Uh, I kicked off the encryption uh, course for uh, a lecture. I have a whole you know two week lecture series around encryption, the importance of encryption at the Citadel. Talking about not just protecting communications, but also uh, providing non repudiation for who sent the orders to, you know, retreat or attack or stand down, whatever. You guys stay around. You get to hang out with Jerry and Jaw Jack. That's right, buddy. Gaming with the cat. That sock. Hold on. That sock blog in the newsletter was 100% great. Thank you, IDK. Thanks, IDK. I will tell you guys that sock blog um, is awesome. Eric Capuano. It, it you know, tag Eric Capuano on LinkedIn and let him know that you enjoyed it or comment on his his blog post. Very nice, Harish Kumar. Love it. Oh, thanks, Jess Ben. Love it. What did Brady do? Hold on. What did Brady do? I love me some Brady McNulty. What did Brady do? Pass CASP Plus this weekend. Still have no idea how the heck that happened. LOL. Way to go, Brady. Nice, man. Nailing it. Just started listening to Dark Knight Diaries and heard the VTech hack story. Nice. Nate, um, there's a lot of great stories on there. Um... You know what's a, a nice one? It's an early one, Nate, but Black Duck Eggs. That that one always kind of s stayed with me. Very good one. Guys, I will tell you, I'm thinking about, like, I kind of, like, I shouldn't, whatever. I wish I had more time. I wish I, I wish Simply Cyber was more full-time. I would love to do um, a series of videos that map to those, that Eric Capuano sock blog post and, and like, four videos step through it and basically execute the blog posts and show you exactly how to do it and kind of lead it as a as a lecture or as a class or whatever i would really like to do that because i'd love to help people it would be cool yeah tom bishop it would be good. <laughs> it would be cool man oh yeah Maybe I'll do it. I don't, I've got so many projects going on. I'm working on like a secret course right now that I can't tell anyone about. Uh, that'll be out by the end of March. Uh, I got a speaking and oh guys, oh here's something. See, Kimberly, this is what I'm talking about. Straight cash, homie. <laughs> I, I just say Kimberly and I naturally hit the straight cash, homie button, even if it doesn't matter. This is what I was talking to Kimberly the other day about. Like, here's a thing um, that I forgot to tell you guys. Like, I'm speaking at a conference tomorrow. Um. <laughs> It's a free conference. It's it's presented by Anti Siphon. You can see right here. Um, where is it? I'll, I'll drop a link in. Ch oh God. Here, oh, Jesus. Hold on one second. I want to know where. Can I see the itinerary, bro? Well, I'm speaking at three o'clock on um, everything about. Hold on. Why isn't the, I don't know why the agenda isn't released. I can't really show you the agenda, but believe me, um, I'm giving a talk at three o'clock Eastern time, I think. Let me look at my calendar really quickly. I'll tell you definitively. Register for it. It's free. Um, <laughs> you guys want to see what my calendar looks like? Hold on. I just want to make sure there's nothing sensitive in here. Look at my calendar. This is my calendar. <laughs> All right. So right here is where I'm talking. Three o'clock. Three o'clock on, on Wednesday, guys. So Jojo, I do not do mentorships. No, I mentor like for for what I do. I guess I like to mentor at scale. So I, I don't have the bandwidth or time to do individual mentorship. So I created Simply Cyber so I could help thousands of people all at the same time and basically have an economy of scale of my knowledge and experience to help people. Yeah, mass mentoring, Shane. Thank you. Yeah. Here, I'll, I'll drop a link to the anti-siphon thing anyways. Um, like I said, I don't know where the agenda is, but I'm definitely talking at three o'clock and the title of the talk is um 
The title of the talk is, uh, here, I'm going to show you guys really quickly. See, this is why you guys stay tuned for the jaw jacking, right? Because it's, it's good. You're going to get an early sneak peek at this. All right, come on now. <laughs> I definitely made a deck for this. Where is it? Um, <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. I definitely made a deck for this. I don't, I don't know where it is. Wait, let me do this really quickly. Apologies to, uh, apologies to Matt Damon. We ran out of time. <laughs> I do love that joke. Um, here we go. This will be worth it. Believe me. Oh, I guess I don't know. I definitely have a link to the stupid tr our, our our messages. Sorry, I'm like making you guys look at me, but I don't know where it is. I I have I was gonna show show you the slides, right? I think the slides are really really cool. Oh, you know what? I think I did it on Canva. That's why I can't find it in Google Drive. Ha ha ah, ha 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 ha. Check me out. So this is this is the uh, slides. Everything pen testing you didn't know you needed to know. And it's going to be me and Paul Imey. This dude's a rock star. Love that guy. And I won't show you the third slide. You'll have to show up. I forgot I did it in Canva. I was playing with Canva's uh, PowerPoint creation just to kind of experiment with it and see how it was. It's all right. <laughs> Matt Damon, yeah, I love it. Thank you, Gaming with the Cat. Thank you, Michael Adams. I hope you guys like it. It's I, I'm excited. Here's the thing. Anti Siphon, this is how it went. Like I love what Anti Siphon's doing so much, and Black Hills has done so much for good for the community that when I saw this summit, I reached out to the conference organizer who I know personally, and I asked her, I said, Hey, listen. I would love to help. Can Simply Cyber donate? Like, I'd love to sponsor, like, throw money at it. Like, help you guys achieve your mission because I love what you're doing. And it's free to attend, which means, guys, at the end of the day, like, things cost money, right? Like, as much as, like, free is fun and community-driven, like, it costs money to put on these events and, and host these things, right? There's technology, hardware, people, time, energy, effort, venues, and I said, I'd love to, you know, sponsor. And, and she said, well, we've, we don't need money right now, but we need another speaker. Would you like to talk? And I was like, all right, all right, all right. So I, um, I contributed to this in that capacity. Um, so that's, that's how it came to be. I don't typically just like randomly, not to mention this is a red team offensive security conference, which as many of you know, <laughs> is not my strength, but I do have experience hiring pen testers, knowing what I want from a pen tester. Surprise, guys. There's a lot of spoilers coming out in um, my talk. Like, it's not about, like, find the elite zero day. Like, I'll just give you, like, one little teaser, maybe to interest you in coming to the talk. You know what I need? I need? I would pay 15 grand in order for you to tell my boss the same thing I've been telling my boss for six months, but tell it as an independent third party in order for me to get my initiatives, my agenda move forward. Boss isn't listening to me. A lot of lip service, a lot of noise. Independent third party comes in. Oh, well, we should fix that because now if we get popped for that, we can say that we had an independent third party find this problem and we did nothing about it. Insurance companies don't like that, brah. All right, well, let's leave on a high note, guys. Genuinely appreciate y'all being here. Uh, hopefully you can attend tomorrow. Congratulations to uh, Tom Bishop on getting tagged. Thank you very much for Alana for continuing the chain. Tom, you will be six of six on the chain. All the best to everybody. Have a great rest of your day. And until next time, stay secure.